the diagnosis was leprosy. We do not know this man's name. We don't know his age. We don't know what he did for a living. We don't know if he was married with young children or if he was the sole breadwinner for his aged parents. We, we know literally nothing about this man other than one thing. He was a leper. But I want to try to use my imagination just a little bit this morning Based upon the text here and some other texts in Leviticus, we can learn in Leviticus chapter 13 that there are laws written for the Jews that speak to how to deal with this dangerous disease that most believe even today would be called Hansen's disease. It's still around. It's not prominent, but it's still around. I want you to put yourself in this man's sandals 2,000 years ago. One morning... While washing his face, this man felt a tender spot under his beard, maybe. And he moved the hair away from the spot to see a bright white bump just on the top of his skin. Then he noticed, too, that the hair all around that spot had begun to turn white. And even the hair closest to that spot was actually absolutely pure white, even though his hair hadn't yet started to change color. It was too white. Immediate fear struck this man. I mean, this, this could have been an ingrown hair like he had had dozens of times before. It could have been a bug bite. I'm sure that was rampant in that time. Maybe this was just a small infected cut, but something about that bump reminds him of what had happened just a few days ago, using my imagination. Just days before, he was walking into town, and just as he reached, or just as he came over the hill to get into town, he saw it, or he saw him, rather, just a few feet off the road. Nowhere near the 100 paces away that that man was supposed to be away from the road. And no sooner had the man seen this person kneeling over there, but he also smelled the awful stench of being back wind of him. The body odor mixed with the unwashed rags mixed with the, there's no nice way to say it, just the rot of human flesh mingled in our traveler's nose as he saw this stooped figure on the side of the road. He knew right away there's a leper. And his father had told him about this, as, about this disease as his father before him had warned him. It started with just a white spot on the skin that would numb the nerves and deaden the hair follicles all around it until eventually it would spread like we know cancer all over the body, killing a person inch by inch with open wounds and sores. It could be spread by any number of ways. That's why there were so strict laws about the handling of this disease and about how they ought to handle those who contracted it. But this leper on the side of the road was a pathetic sight. He wore little more than rags and had a scraggly beard that covered up most of his face. What his beard didn't cover, his long stringy hair was pushed down over his eyes so that no one could see who he was as Levitical law made them do, had to have their hair covering their face. He couldn't even make eye contact with people. He was an outcast. He was huddled over a bowl of table scraps, and no doubt this was the designated meeting place where some friend or family member would drop off what little food they could spare, and they would yell for him and leave, and then he would come by and eat the scraps. The sight and the smell and the shock all converged in a single panic gasp when the poor hunched over figure jumped to his feet, seeing the man coming up, and he yells out, unclean, unclean. Our traveler probably backs away and maybe yells back in return, what are you doing so close to the road? Get back. Go back to your hole. That was his indignant reply. 
And the leper, I can just imagine, grabbed as many scraps as he possibly could, all the while screaming, backing away, running away, unclean, unclean. Our traveler picked up a rock to throw it at the outcast to punish him for getting so near the road where travelers frequented. But he realized very quickly that he had picked up a, a morsel of the food that the wretch had been earlier eating, and it was still wet with the man's saliva. And just kind of in a, a moment of thoughtless disgust, he, he dropped the food and he wipes the filth on the scrap of material that hung around his neck. All the way home, he mutters to himself, making sure to mark in his mind to talk to their priest the first thing tomorrow morning to see if there's anything that they can do with that community of lepers just outside the city gates to see if maybe they could drop or drive them out further away from town. I mean, after all, this guy's got kids, and he doesn't want them to come within miles of that filthy disease. But all that vanished away when he, he walked into his courtyard that evening and he's met with the joyful and laughter, all the shrieks of his two girls as they jump on him. Ava, Ava's home. The, the pair of girls, they run out to meet him and he almost fell under their weight as they jump in his arms. With both girls in his arms, there was a little room for his wife to join in, but the girls simultaneously grab her and they snatch her into this huge family hug. Life was good. God was good. But now standing in front of his wife's heirloom hammered bronze mirror, looking on that spot, just under his beard, he wasn't so sure. He pulled the collar of his tunic to the side and he saw several more spots that looked deeper than the one under his beard. And they were itchy and scaly. And he determined that he had to go see the priest so that all of his wonderings about what this condition might be could be put at ease. That's going to set his mind at rest. He's going to go to the priest the priest will review the laws of the Torah, and he would then send him on his way as a clean man, no big deal, just a, a rare skin, di skin disease, nothing to be worried about. So before he leaves that morning, he pulls his wife in and gives her a quick peck on the cheek. He kisses the top of his daughter's head. He says, see you for dinner. That would be the last time that he would ever be that close to his girls. His visit with the priest didn't go as he had planned. Immediately, the priest, almost without touching him, pulls his hands away and, and gasps, unclean. Unclean, a little louder, the priest says. And the, urge, the priest urgently warns, and he begins to pour water all over his hands, and he pointed out, away, unclean. Almost as if he can't say anything else. He can't get past those words, that word was fell over on a stool trying to get away, calling for guards to escort this man out of town to the rest of the lepers. His fate was sealed. Never again would he walk into his courtyard and be tackled by his girls. He would never be able to hold his wife or sit down at the table with his family again. His life would be lived 100 paces away from them from now on. No festivals, no feasts, no weddings, no grandchildren. Life for this unclean man, this unclean life, was now lived a hundred paces away from his girls. He wondered what his littlest would think of all of this. None of them would understand why this had happened, but she might think that he had abandoned them. And that, as he is run out of town, he begins to think about them. How can he provide for them now? What would they do? His leprosy would put them out on the streets. They would have to beg and live off of the kindness of their neighbors. And they would have to gather grain from the fields at the edges of the towns like the other beggars, like Ruth did in the Old Testament. 
this wasn't his plan at all. This was so far from what he had planned for his life. This wasn't supposed to be how it went. Unclean. There was no cure. There was no hope. He was taken to the edge of town and he was shoved out with strict warnings to obey the law. Stay away and to scream, unclean, when any passerby might get too close. I can just imagine that first night at the leper commune with few others that had been cast out of society. Each of them at very degrees of this leprous condition sitting around the fire. Some probably like him looked okay. Maybe just a few white spots easily hidden beneath the beard, beneath the scarf. But others, with the ailment affecting the extremities first, sitting around that campfire that evening, there were people with whole fingers and toes that had started decaying. Noses looked like open, wounded stubs. They had begun to not even look human. What did they talk about? I can imagine that they wanted to hear this new guy's story. And, and I can just even think that there might have been some kind of scuffle between he and, and that leper that was by the roadside just days ago. I mean, after all, all this was his fault. He wouldn't be here right now if he hadn't come across that guy on the street a couple of days ago. If he hadn't been so careless camping out so close to the road, it's his fault. As the fire burned down to embers, so did the tempers, and, and I can just hear it among the, leper, the lepers. Some were skeptical, but some still had just a sliver of hope. And I can just imagine one of the lepers saying, I heard he turned whole jugs of water into wine. The skeptic in the crown. Sure. Yeah. Sounds like somebody had drunk a whole jug of wine before they told that story. Maybe another one said, someone told me that he cast out demons just by commanding them. And I'm sure the excuse was given, well, they probably paid them off. We've seen these neo-Messiah charlatans before. All it takes is just a little bit of money, a guy to act like he's possessed, and then convulse when the command is given, and he's said to be free from his demon. It's probably all a sham. And then I can just imagine a third say, but have you heard what people are saying about the way he teaches? Authority. I mean, he teaches with conviction as if he truly believes every single jot, every single tittle of the law. He is the Messiah. He must be. He speaks with such authority. And night after night, I can just kind of see these same stories being told around the campfire. The leprosy grew and hope shrunk and shrunk. But one night, maybe a little further away, just far enough away from the glint of the fire, weeks have gone by, and they, this group around the campfire, they hear a, a raspy voice of, of one of the far-gone lepers who doesn't even want to come close to them. And I can just imagine he just kind of gasps out, I heard he heals. Heals. Just a few days ago, I heard that he healed an old woman with a fever. And when the rest of Capernaum heard about it, they all came to visit him. And he healed every single one. I heard he heals. Well, Capernaum, that's not far. That's just a few miles from here. They'd been talking about Jesus for months, and he had never been very far away, but now he was just down the road. And that was when our friend, the traveler, now turned leper, he made up his mind that no matter what, whatever the cost, no matter the law, whoever tried to stop him, he was going to get to Jesus. 
And that's where we pick up Mark chapter 1, verse 40. Now a leper came to Jesus, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now look, up to this point, I've been telling you a story, and I've filled in a lot of what we do not know with just my imagination. We don't know that any of that was the case, other than that at one point, this man was not a leper, and then he contracted the disease and was cast out from society. That's all we know. But from here on out, there's something that you need to know. As detrimental and putrid and disgusting and heartbreaking as leprosy was in that culture, sin is worse than and today. It is the stench of rot in a holy God's nostrils. And you can't come near him because you're unclean. Sin will separate you from your family. It will stigmatize you and mark you as unclean before a holy God. Sin will rot you to your very core. It will numb you. The calluses that sin builds up in your life will cause you to be bitter and cynical. Sin will lie to you and tell you that there is no hope, that this is just your lot in life, that this burden is the one that you will have to bear your entire life. Hear me this morning. Do not listen to that lie. There is hope, not just for 2,000 years ago for a leper on the roadside, but for you here sitting in Jolton, Tennessee today. The leper comes to Jesus and he says, I love the way he frames the request. He doesn't even ask. He just makes a statement when he comes to Jesus. He says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. There are two things that you need to know about Jesus from this chapter, from this story. Number one, Jesus is always willing. <laughs> Jesus is always willing. If you are willing, Jesus. He is always willing. There is not one leprous sinner who comes to Christ with sincerity that he will turn away. Christ loves restoring families, bringing husband and wife, estranged child and parent back together to his, that's his passion. He lives to take the stigma of sin from off your life and to clothe you in his righteousness. He moves on the heart of the most calloused and cynical and whispers that he is willing to give them life and not just life, not just existence, but life more abundantly. He promises that. He loves to do that work. He's willing to bring the truth of the gospel into your life. In him, there is always hope. Sin is not your lot in life, but sanctification is. It's what he, before the foundations of the world were even laid, it's what he put in motion, your salvation and sanctification, bringing you into a closer and more sincere relationship with the Almighty Father. He's willing to take your burden, to loose it from off your back, and to bury it in the tomb where his body once lay, but he's not there anymore. Jesus is always willing, always. But what doctor, seeing his patient, isn't willing to heal, right? Every doctor is willing to heal. Heal. Every single one would heal if it were within his ability. But too often the, the diagnosis is beyond their control. Instead of healing, they try to bring comfort. Instead of healing, they give you a timetable. Every doctor is willing, but they're not always able. But see, that's the second thing you need to know about Jesus, is that Jesus is always able always. There is no sin 
too bad. There is no relationship too broken. No stigma too stuck. No situation too hopeless. No burden too heavy that Christ cannot forgive, mend, make new, restore, or loose from off your back. If you are willing, Jesus, you can make me clean. Church, aren't you glad that Jesus is always willing and able? Verse 41, because it gets better. (laughs) Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing. Be cleansed. As soon as as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. You see, worse than the leprosy of this man's skin was the sin of his heart. And in this, verse 42, Jesus deals with both. When it says the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. Physical and spiritual healing. But I want us to just a few moments focus on that phrase which compelled Jesus to heal and forgive this man. Verse 41, where it says, Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him. That phrase, moved with compassion, it's just one word in the original language. And it's actually the word that we get our word spleen from. (laughs) Moved with compassion. It's a derivative of what we get spleen from. It means essentially that Jesus felt pity for this leper in his gut. Now, more modernly, we might say that it was heartache, that it was the proverbial kidney punch to Jesus that day. He sees this man suffering, and it hurts him to see him suffer. Now, of all the emotions that Jesus could have felt, could have felt. I mean, let's just talk about one of those. Anger. (laughs) Anger for this man's disobedience to Levitical law was probably the prime one. This man wasn't supposed to be anywhere near civilization, and he is standing right in front of Jesus, endangering a whole crowd of people with this infectious disease. Jesus could have felt anger towards him, but instead, Jesus feels his pain. I bring this up this morning because it's important that you know that Jesus both judged and had compassion on this man simultaneously. We live in a world of Don't judge me. We work out at places where the theme is no judgment zone. We love not being judged. But let me tell you today, if you are not judged, grace cannot be extended. Jesus simultaneously judges this man's situation and at the same time gives him grace. He comes to Jesus in all of his leprous filth, and Jesus could have soothed his conscience, and he could have said non-judgingly, you're not that bad. I've seen a lot worse. And the man would have gone on his way, affirmed, but still infirmed. And that's a lot of people who will leave a lot of churches today. They will leave the church house Affirmed, but still infirmed with sin. Jesus loves you too much to let that happen to you. He doesn't care about your feelings when your life is at stake. So Jesus rightly judges his issue of leprosy and sin, and immediately he extends grace. By the way, that's that's something that we Christians probably need to learn as well. We've got a stigma of judging others because we do not judge and give grace simultaneously like Jesus did. 
We need to learn or relearn grace. Jesus judges. He sees this man has leprosy. And in that moment, he also gives grace and says, I will heal him. He was moved with compassion to do so. He felt it. In his inner core, this person is hurting. I have the answer. I will do something about it. He was moved with compassion. The very end of the story and the chapter, it gives us two ironies that I want us to look at before we circle back to this idea. Continue reading with me in verse 43. And Jesus strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way and show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Go make sure that it's okay for you to get back into society. Before you visit your home, go to the priest, follow Levitical law, make a sacrifice as Leviticus 13 might suggest or might command, and then go about your way. Verse 45, however, the cleansed leper went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. What are the two ironies that were presented in the rest of this story? Number one, the leper understood more about evangelism than we do. The leper understands more about evangelism than we do. Jesus says, don't tell anybody about this. However, verse 45, he began, he went out and began to proclaim it freely to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city. Isn't it ironic that Jesus tells the leper to not tell anyone, and he does, but Christ has commanded us to witness and we don't? Don't tell anybody that I healed you. And he goes out telling everyone, Jesus healed me. Jesus heals us, he saves us, and he says, now go. And we're like, thanks, Jesus. We have made Mark 1, 43 our life verse, and we don't even mean to with our silence. You know, there's no class given. There's no evangelism 101. There's no how to influence friends and stuff like that. There's no Romans Road to Salvation class. No, learn this Bible verse and then apply it and see how this person reacts to that. There's none of that given. I have loved what one old preacher said. He said, evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where he got the bread. That's all this is too. Evangelism is just one leper telling another leper where he got the healing. Hey, church, We have been healed, and we're just, we're satisfied with ours. Thanks, Lord. Appreciate it. We're not moved with compassion. We don't feel it in our gut. We don't weep over lost souls. It doesn't keep us up at night. It doesn't change us or how we act. We're healed. We get to go home with a restoration of family, and and for some reason, we don't think that anyone else around us needs that too. Oh, but man, they are, while not living in a commune, your next door neighbor is just as lonely, just as needing of a savior, and just as needing spiritual healing as you did. This leper, he understood more about evangelism than we do today. But secondly, this is something that I'd never seen in the text before this week. What's the second irony to this last part of the story is that Christ literally takes the place of the leper. When the lady's just saying moments ago, his life for mine, that's exactly what Jesus does for the leper. We really can't speculate as to why Jesus would give this healed man a command like he does in verses 43, verse 44. Don't tell anybody about this. My assumption 
is that Jesus' goal was to stay in that town, to preach in the synagogues, and to minister in that city. But since his popularity was spread so quickly, he couldn't even get into the city. So he was literally incapable of ministering in the city. Instead, he has to now preach, instead of preaching in the synagogues, he has to now preach in the desert. Instead of sleeping in a cozy house from one of his disciples, he's got to sit, sleep on a rock in the deserted places, as verse 45 would say. Did you notice that Jesus traded places with the leper? Where once the leper was cast out of the city, made to dwell in deserted places, now Jesus has healed him, the leper gets to go back home, and Jesus is made to stay out, on the, stay out in the desert. It's the great transaction that he gives you all his righteousness. He gives you all his right standing with God. And when you accept it, he was cut off. He was crucified. And in those hours on the cross, there was great darkness. That's because a holy God, the Father, cannot even look on the unrighteousness that Jesus Christ took upon the weight of his shoulders that day. That's why Jesus, while on the cross, said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every other time in scripture, he had always called God Father, but not this time. He was separated from his Father, and he couldn't even say Dad. He could only say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was cut off so that I could be restored. He called him God so that I could call him Dad. The leper has been given this beautiful transaction of Christ to where he takes the desert and we take the relationship. Church, moved with compassion. We are hardly stirred with emotion. The weakest of things. And Jesus, looking at this man's bereft situation, knowing that he has all power in his hands, and that moments he's going to be healed, he still is moved with compassion. The two ironies, that the leper understands evangelism more than we do, and that the Son of God would take the desert, and that we could go home. 